There is this room, and there is me. No windows. No way out. There is my desk, laid out before me. Pens, papers, and the remains of my lunch near the door. I've been here for... years. There is the work. It spreads out before me, papers aged and new, pens in all the types and colors I can think to ask for. I have a typewriter in the corner, and they keep me stocked with ribbons. A letter is laid on the table before me, half written. Elizabeth. The baby died. She was born gasping and too small. She died. Do not come here. I do not know who Elizabeth is. I'm just doing my job. I finish the letter. There is nothing you can do. There has never been anything you could do. Emily. This is what they want from me. I search through the scattered paper on my desk until I find the proper envelope, small and brown. I have printed it with an address I have never seen. Time to send it away. There is a mail slot on the door, above the hatch for my meals. It swings two ways. The letter passes through and is gone. I cannot reach them once they leave the slot. Lifting the little door and peering out as though through a keyhole reveals only a blank bit of wall painted white. The floor out there is linoleum tile in institutional gray and green. The letter is gone. The letter is gone and I'm at loose ends. My room is crowded with papers and writing tools. I have reference books on historical ephemera stacked and lined up along the foot of my bed. Most of the time, I'm fine. Most of the time, I can build towers of the work. Cityscapes of false lives, peopled with words I make them speak. I move within the sentiments they give me. Most of the time, I walk in the city they and I have built together. Until I reach the outskirts, where buildings peter out. There are no lies to spin here. When the tasks fall away, there is no city. No voices to speak for. There is only the quiet. I tap a pen on my desk. I try the door again. The door is locked. The door is always locked. Why is there a door here at all? Why not just wall me in? Brick on a brick. Wasn't there a story about that once? Something to do with wine? I can't remember. I don't like to think about this. The door on the mail slot swings. The little door swings toward me and a page slides through. I lunge for it. Peer out again, but no one is there. I look at the instructions they have provided. It is a list of things they want, as usual. I look at the door again, but I'm not even fooling myself. I get to work. Let's see, letter from Jennifer to her husband about the divorce. Okay. Matt, do not look for me. I have gone. I took my clothes and toothbrush, but all your things remain. All the things we bought together. I don't want them anymore. I want a, a tiny apartment with a cat. I want the peace of solitude and slow mornings where the only breakfast I must make is my own. The only person I must see out the door is myself. So I am gone. I am not coming back. There will be papers for you to sign, but I will not bring them to you. Sign them, Jennifer. I write this in loose and spiked cursive on expensive gray paper. 
I slash the crosses and dots savagely onto the page. Jennifer, I think, is trapped. Or was. Let her pen celebrate its freedom by gouging at this page. In the end, I fold it neatly. Conceal the words in the elegant dove gray paper. This must be correct, for I've never had a correction. Letter inviting Hannah to stay over. Cheap printer paper for this one. I tear a ragged corner off and scrawl on it in childish hand. For Hannah, don't read, Emily. Can you stay tonight? I built us a tent in the attic. I got the stuff you wanted. Please stay. Ask your mom. I fold the note in half, roughly. Note accepting. This one, I form carefully. I pretend I'm just beginning to learn calligraphy. It is written on the same cheap and torn printer paper, but the corners of this are carefully folded inward. I will stay over. Thanks for getting my things. We will have a good night. At the last, I place a sticker of a unicorn over the place the torn edges touch, then lift it away. This note has already been read, after all. Note on brittle and old lined paper, containing a conversation between Laura and Mark. A page torn from a notebook, folded into fourths, and then again into eighths. Each section a tiny page with a tiny fragment of conversation. A window out of this room, and into lives I will not live. It's starting to snow. Can I walk you home tonight? I want to show you something. Printed with a black Bic pen. I switch to a blue felt tip. A new little window in which to work. The pen bleeds through and spreads blue stains that partially blot out the other words. I let it happen. Authenticity. What do you want to show me? It's cold. It'll almost be dark when we're off. Next window. I know, I make him reply. But trust me, I found something scary. You won't remember your cold. Please, let me walk you home. It's only a little out of our way. I want to go with him, even though he is only words on paper. I want to see this frightening thing. I would even like to see snow. But Laura... Laura isn't so sure. What's so cool about it? Why tonight? The cold is awfully memorable. Even as I write this, I urge Laura to go. I will make Mark more persuasive. Come on, it's amazing! You like poetry, right? You'll love this place I found. Poetry is written on the walls. I brought candles. We'll read it like penitence, like we're saying a rosary. The snow just makes it perfect. I can see an abandoned house then, covered in a desperate scrawl, someone writing beautiful words in a crumbling house. I would go to see it. I turn to the next folded section. I will not go with you to see some graffiti. It's close to zero out there, snowing and almost dark. Go yourself. Find someone else. Stop pressuring me. Mark and I are denied, but I would never see this poet's house anyway. I refold the paper, dip one corner of it into a bowl of cold tea, open it, and refold it three more times. Finally, I place it in the middle of my stacked reference books to age for a bit. The rest of the notes go out the slot. They fall without sound to the green and gray tile. And I have finished again. I spin around in my chair. White walls pinned with bits of paper whirl around me. Once more, the room is small. I don't know what time it is. My dinner sits on a tray near the door. I'd forgotten about it. Soup. Something with a rich broth and vegetables. They served it to me in a pretty glazed bowl, with a golden crusted roll on the side. I believe my silverware is real silver, too. The soup is cold now. Its surface has thickened. Not very appetizing. I dip a spoon into the soup anyway. I feel something solid at the bottom of the bowl. Something hard. It ticks against the side of the bowl as I drag it out of the soup. 
Broth drips from the tip of a key. For a moment, I just stare, uncomprehending. It can't be, and if it is, it can't unlock my door. Impossible. I stand up. My hands start to shake. I go to the door. My chair falls into a stack of books, which also tumble down. I don't care. I stumble to the door. My hands are shaking so badly I need both of them to guide the key into the lock. It slides home. Smoothly. It turns. I start to turn the key, and then I stop. I can barely remember anything outside this room. I don't even know how long I've been here. I think of the conversation I wrote just now between Laura and Mark. They are not real people. They cannot be. But I would have gone to see the house of the mad poet, and I will see where the institutional gray and green tiled hallway leads. I open the door. I don't know what I expect when I open the door. It does not even creak. The hallway runs long and empty. Doors punctuated at regular intervals, like a hotel, but with heavy locks on each one. I run down the hallway. An unlocked door swings free at the end of the hall. It opens into an echoing concrete stairwell. Far below, boots are stamping around the staircase. But I don't care. There's a window here. I can see the world. It's not the world I left. Twisting towers rise into a hazy sky, painted orange by an unseen sunset. I cannot find a trace of green here. No soft layer of snow. The world has come to me only in distant snatches of memory these past years. But this doesn't match it. The footsteps grow louder. I can't stay here. I will not go back to that room. Not now. I run up the stairwell. They are coming. I cannot stand here and stare at that alien sky. I run. I don't know how tall this building is, but I will climb it. My feet slap against the steps, but their sound is drowned out by the pounding boots below. They are gaining on me, but I'm only stopped by a door barring my path. I can go no further. I rattle at the handle. It must be locked. All my doors have been locked for so long, it must be locked. But it is not. Some beautiful fool must have left it open. I stumble onto the roof. I can go no further. Suddenly this seems inevitable. What did I think would happen if I left my room? Here I stand, trapped in a world I don't recognize. Dull spires thrust themselves into the haze of dying light. It is not the quiet beauty I hoped for, but I decide it is enough. On numb feet, I walk to the edge and stare down the dizzying height. I don't know where I am, but I will really be here. No paper spun lies, just me in this sky. I can almost prevent myself from startling when the door slams open again. I will not turn around. I will not dignify them with my gaze. They shouted me to freeze, which I have already done. To turn around and go back inside, which I will not do. I stand and stare into the sun. I refuse to hear them. I will have my moment with the sunset. I will stare into the red haze until I've had my fill. I'm quitting. As of now, my work is done. I've done what I had to do. 
and the men behind me. They do what they have to do. I know it, but I can't make myself care. I hear the crack of a gun, and the red haze of sunset is inside my head.